You're listening to the First Baptist Rockdale Sunday Sermons Podcast. First Baptist Rockdale is a church dedicated to making disciples who make disciples. We hope you enjoy this week's message. Uh, Esther chapter 9 is obviously where you go for the second week of Advent, right? I mean, we all know that. That's, no, that's not true. Uh, but we are going to finish the book of Esther today, and then the last two, next two weeks um, we'll be focused a little more closely on Christmas. But what I love about how God kind of orchestrates things um, is whenever I sat down uh, early this year and said, hey, I'm going to preach through the book of Esther, and I began to map out how my, my sermon series were going to go and where everything was going to be pushed, um, God knew the content of Esther chapter 9 when I sat down and did that, right? And, and Matt is not, uh, I know the Bible a, a little bit, right? I've read it a couple times and I spend a lot of time in it. Um, but Matt is not that smart to put things together like God puts things together. And God has a way providentially, as we've seen through the book of Esther, to drive his purposes together. Uh, and so now as we enter into this Christmas season... Uh, we enter the end, we, we reach the end of the book of Esther. The climax has been achieved. If you haven't been here for a while, I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version of the book of Esther. Esther was a Jewish girl uh, who was basically kidnapped and made the queen of Persia. Uh, that's kind of her story. Um, her, she was raised by her cousin, a man named Mordecai. And for reasons that were not totally clear of, Mordecai was deemed to be an enemy uh, of, of uh, the the. The leadership in Persia, there was one major villain named Haman who desired to kill uh, Esther's cousin Mordecai um, and, and sought to do that. But instead of just killing him, which he very easily could have accomplished, instead he proposed to kill all of his descendants, all of his relatives, the entire Jewish nation in the Persian Empire. And so he set out to have what would be deemed a holocaust of the Jews across all of Persia, uh, which stretched from India to Ethiopia. As you look at your map in your mind, that's a lot of the world right there. That was basically where any Jew lived was inside of that area. And so it was going to be a mass annihilation event that was going to take place. He fixed a date and time and said, on this day we'll have um, this great um, you know, cleansing of our country uh, from these people who, who think differently and worship differently than us. Uh, but God, in his infinite wisdom, turned all of that around. Um, and Mordecai was elevated above Haman, the villain. Haman was executed on the gallows that he set up to kill Mordecai on. Haman's children, uh, his sons who followed in his way, were killed, along with a bunch of people who were enemies of the Jewish people. And so God saved the nation of Israel, and God allowed the enemies of Israel to be punished. Um, for their desire to kill them. And it seems like the story has wrapped up, but there's one more detail um, that the writer of the book of Esther wants us to be aware of, and that is that there is a commemoration for this event when God provided and protected his people. There's an annual celebration that they're going to have. The Jews were very um, notorious for having festivals, feast days, sacrifice days, special days that they fixed in the calendar and said, we will remember this event on this day, like Passover, right? And we'll remember what God did on this day and we'll celebrate it forever. And so there's a holiday being dedicated for the salvation of the Jews uh, and it's called Purim, and we'll read it here in Esther chapter 9, starting in verse 20. And Mordecai recorded these things, of what had happened, and sent letters to all of the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, that's the Persian king, both near and far. And he obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar, and also the 15th day of the same, year by year, as days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month that had been returned had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday. And they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and, uh, and gifts to the poor. Okay, so uh, this holiday that's being um, declared is going to be on a specific day, the 14th and 15th of Adar, which doesn't mean anything to us, and that's not that big of a deal, but on a specific day, 
they're going to have this holiday to remember the day that God turned the fortunes of the Jewish people from sorrow to joy, right, from, from, from fear to victory, this day that they're going to celebrate what God has accomplished in the world. And on that day, they'll send gifts to one another and they'll give, uh, provide for the poor. I don't know what holiday that sounds like to you today in a regular American Christianity. Typically, we celebrate it with a tree and presents and a big fat guy coming down your chimney, right? That's the sort of holiday that we've co-opted there. Now, Purim is not directly associated with Christmas. It's not the same holiday, right? Christmas, we celebrate the arrival of the Christ child, the one who's going to make a way for us that God drew near to us. But Christmas came in a time when the world was particularly dark, when sorrow was great, right? The, uh, I, I love uh, the song, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Doc has sung that the last several Christmas Eves. Um, but, but inside of that song, right, it's like, you know, there is no peace on earth, I said, right? For, for, for hate is winning, right? And wrongs are winning. The world is dark, right? Lost in sin and error, pining, another Christmas carol says. But then God breaks into the world and turns sorrow into joy, right? God takes war and, 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 and destruction, and the Prince of Peace is entered in to the world, and because of that, we celebrate. Mordecai issued a worldwide, known worldwide, celebration for the Jews. And he said, we are going to celebrate how God provided for us. We're going to celebrate the providence of God, that God is working in our midst to provide everything that we need. We will celebrate those things. As Christians, we are called to celebrate. Right, we were called to celebrate. We don't always look like that. That's one of one of the one of the things that always kind of shakes me about church. Is sometimes we walk in here and it's like duty, it's obligation. Oh, it's Sunday morning. It's uh, ten twenty-five. I better get in there because they're going to start the service without me. We call it a service. Like this is our service to God that we would show up and be here. I'm going to go to the church service and I'm going to be a part of what's happening here. But this is actually a celebration event. Well, we are called to celebrate. We're called to celebrate how God has provided for us. All right, I say it around Easter, and hopefully I say it throughout the rest of the year, but we are Easter Christians. Right? Every Sunday, we're called to celebrate what God has done. This place should be a place of joy and celebration. Now, I'm not saying go full Pentecostal in here, okay? Right? We don't need to be running laps. If you want to, that's fine. Some of us, it would not hurt us to run a few laps. I'm just saying, okay? Right, some, some New Year's resolutions for some of us would not hurt us. But, but I'm not saying that you need to be a full Pentecostal. You don't have to be clapping your hands and waving them in the air. We don't need to get banners. Right? I like the banner churches. If anyone ever been to a banner church, that's a fun place to be. You get the flags, you're waving them around. No. Some of y'all need to stretch your little, your, your little bounds of Christianity a little bit. The, the world is wide out there. Right? Some of you need to not stretch it as far as you have, Bill. Um, right? Just come back home. Okay, a little bit. Right? Right, but, but, but if you've seen the, the breadth of Christianity, sometimes you go to a church, like, man, that is a church of celebration. Uh, I remember I was at Houston Baptist University. I was in a, I don't even know what class I was in, but one of the requirements of the class was to go to an ethnic church. Um, and, and while uh, my church was probably an ethnic church of some sort, right, Anglo, I don't really know, um, what they meant was a church different than the church that you went to. So if you were a, a, a black Baptist at Houston Baptist University, you might go to a Hispanic or a white Baptist church. And if you were a white Baptist like myself, uh, then you would go to a Hispanic or a black or a Korean or a whatever uh, Baptist church. Um, and so uh, being from Houston, uh, I found the nearest uh, black Baptist church to the church that I grew up going to, and I went to that church uh, as a sophomore in college, maybe a freshman in college, because I wasn't married yet. Or my wife just didn't go with me. It's one or the other. Regardless, I went to this church alone. Um, and what you do, by the way, this is how you know someone's visiting a church. Um, visitors come to church early. They get there before the time it's supposed to start. They show up when they're supposed to. And then they walk in and the room is empty. Right? I'm usually in this room about 15 minutes before the service. Because visitors don't know that you guys show up late. They don't know it. Right? They think that they're supposed to, the service starts at 10.30, it's 10.23, I'm going to walk in, and then, no, there's no one here at 10.23. You guys are all still somewhere else, right? I don't know what you are, drinking coffee, right? But at 10.32, man, y'all are piling in like 
Well, yeah, yeah, whatever. And then you get upset, someone's on your back row. But at 10, 23, right, you're, you're all, no one's here. And so I got to the church about 15 minutes early, um, and I sat down uh, two-thirds of the way back. Because when you're a visitor at a church, that's what you do. You sit two-thirds of the way back in the church. Why is that? Because you get too close, who knows what's going to happen, right? You may need to leave, right? And if you sit too far back, then you look like you're disrespectful, right? I don't want to be on the very back row. And so you come in about a third or two-thirds of the way, and you sit down, and you kind of just sit there. And so I'm sitting at this Black Baptist church that I've never been in on the wrong side of the tracks uh, in Richmond, Texas. And I literally mean the wrong side of the tracks. There was railroad tracks in Richmond, Texas. They're still there. Um, that's not surprising. Um, but they divide the town still. Uh, right? There's a part of Richmond, Texas that if you tr cross across these railroad tracks, uh, it becomes uh, very, very ethnically different than the other side of the tracks. And that was from historical things. Rockdale, right? You go right over there. i make sure I'm or orchestrated right. right. You go behind Gills a little bit and you get into streets that have numbers. It's the only area in Rockdale that has numbered streets. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Right? Those streets, that area right across there, right, is ethnically different. We have the ACOC over there, right? It's an area of our town that was set up when segregation was a part of our culture, and it never has fully integrated, right? It's a different sort of area. And so I was in this area that I'd never go in because I was told you don't go across the tracks. And I'm sitting in this church uh, a third of the way back, uh, a third of the way in, two thirds of the way back. Uh, and then the pastor walks in because he's the first person in the room. Uh, and I'd never met this man before, but apparently I went to school with his son. Would not have picked him out as a preacher's kid. Maybe, now that I know about preacher kids, because I've got a few, might have picked him out as a preacher kid, to be honest with you. Um, but I didn't know that, right? His son did not strike me as, as the model of Christianity in that moment. Hopefully he sees faith filled. I don't, I don't even know what he's up to now. Maybe that's a Facebook search later. Um, but he comes in, and he introduces himself. He says, why are you sitting way back here? I said, well, you know, I didn't know, da 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 He's like, come on up here. And he takes me from the, the, that row back there where the heads are sitting. He grabs me by the hand. He walks me to the front row, the, the literal front row, the row where nobody sits, right? And he sits me on the front row, and then his wife comes and sits behind, beside me, which the, the wife at a black Baptist church is the first lady. I call my wife that sometimes. She does not like that. Um, but you know, the first lady of that church comes and sits beside me, and, and I'm like an honored guest. Right, the, the lone white person in the room. The, the, the church fills up over the next 20 or so minutes. The service begins. And immediately I'm like, this is different than what I'm used to. There is a celebration that is taking place in this church that is different than what I've experienced in my life. If you've never experienced that, I don't normally tell people to go to other churches. Right? And I don't want you all to go next week. Okay? Um, but over the course of the next year, give yourself a, a Sunday and go experience something different. I love Rising Star Baptist Church. Royal Johnson is a friend of mine. They're here in town. You can go right over there. Uh, listen to what Royal has to say. You'll be blessed by him. You may not come back. If that happens, Royal and I will have a conversation about you, okay? Because I know some things, right? But you're going to experience some things in there. You're like, man, that's different. Right? The celebration is different inside of that, that specific. The Black Baptist Church ethnically has a different celebration mindset. One of my favorite stories about that church, it's really not connected to the sermon, but since I'm talking about that story, I might as well tell it. I'm in there. Two favorite stories. They're both regarded to music. You'll appreciate this. Service begins. They're playing. They've got like a drum set, a trap set over on the ground over here, a few instruments on the stage, and they're all going... And the drummer gets there like 10 minutes late. 10 minutes into the service, he just walks over to the drum set. And, and he's like, sits down. He's getting everything situated for like two minutes. And he picks up his sticks and he's like, T -t 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 -t. like just jumps in 10 minutes late into the service. And nobody cares. My other favorite story, though, is uh, the organist was going. And that's a big deal, by the way, at the Black Baptist Church. It's fun. Uh, he's on stage going. And then all of a sudden, he's done. He's got to go. And so he goes, and I think he does a lap, maybe two laps, I don't know. But he gets away from the organ, okay? He leaves the organ unattended. And a visitor who's visiting his mom from St. Louis is on the back row of the church, and he can play the organ. And the organ is open, and he runs up the center aisle and picks up the organ line. And I'm, I'm watching this like... 
I came from a, a contemporary Southern Baptist church. A, a contemporary Southern Baptist church. And I mean this, like as far as white Southern Baptist churches go, my church was very contemporary. Right, where the, it's now the Bridge Fellowship, right? They don't even have Baptists in their name. Like, you would have no idea what they are. Like, they are a contemporary, seeker-sensitive, we'll say, um, Baptist church. Very contemporary, cutting edge for white Baptist church. That never would have happened in my church, right? They were professionals, right? But in that church, because that moment was... But what that guy was doing is he recognized something was missing, and he could fill that spot... And he immediately jumped in to fill that spot. If he tried to do that at my church, he'd get clotheslined by the worship director as he came up the stage. Get off the stage. You don't belong here. But at that church, that was allowed. It, it blew my mind. My little world exploded in that moment. I was like, you can do that? That's not church. But what happened there was the celebration was real. They recognized their culture Generally speaking, and I understand there's some stereotypes here, right? There's some broad generalizations being made here, so please don't, 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 don't stretch this to where it doesn't belong, right? But inside of that culture, inside of that world, that Sunday gathering is a time to celebrate what God has done. And there's something that we are poorer for, for not having that take. Mordecai declared a day of celebration. He said, we are going to celebrate because God has done something amazing on this. Every Sunday is that day for the Christian church. The reason we celebrate church on Sundays is because on Sunday, Easter morning, Jesus Christ rose from the grave, conquering death and hell, giving us life over death. And because of that, we come here to celebrate together what God has done. It is a pep rally about the goodness of what God has done, but sometimes it becomes a duty for us. Oh, that that would never be the case. They celebrate what God has done. And continuing on in verse 23, it says, So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman, the Agagite, the villain, uh, the son of Hamadetha, the enemy of all the Jews had plotted against them to destroy them and had cast the purr, which is the lots, to crush and destroy them. But when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that his evil plan that he had devised against the Jews would return on his own head and that he and his sons would be hanged on the gallows. Therefore, that day is called Purim, after the term purr. Therefore, because of all that was written in, in this letter and all that they had faced in this matter and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined with them uh, that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written and at that time appointed every year. That these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every clan, every province, every city, and then those days of Purim should never fall into disuse, nor should the uh, commemoration of these days cease among their descendants." And then Esther, the queen, the daughter of Abihel, and Mordecai, the Jew, gave full written authority concerning the second letter about Purim. And letters were sent to all the Jews in the 127 province of the kingdom uh, uh, of Ahasuerus and words of peace and truth. And these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons as Mordecai, uh, the Jew, and Queen Esther obligated them. And as they themselves had obligated, uh, been obligated in their offspring with regard to the fast and their lamenting. The command of Queen Esther confirmed these practices of Purim, and it was recorded in writing. Chapter 10, King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands and the sea and all the acts of his power of might and the full account of his high honor of Mordecai to which the king had advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Mede and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude and his brothers, for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. I want to stop real quick. Chapter 10 is, is just like three verses. That's why I read it there. Um, what chapter 10 is doing is it's setting the story and saying, in case you're wondering, because sometimes we wonder, like this is not a myth. This is not a, this is not a made up story, a fairy tale, Christmas story. This is a historical event. You want to learn more about it? Go to these books in the library because it tells you about it. The book of Esther is firmly writ rooted in history. God had worked in history. The author didn't want you to lose sight of it as you read the story to think, oh, that's a neat story about how God could have done that. It's a story of what God actually did. Right? And you can read about it in these other accounts, these non-biblical accounts, the, the records of the kings of the Persia and, and media. 
right? What he's doing is he's setting it in history. He's saying, don't, don't lose sight. This is real. It's real. Sometimes we, we, we read the Bible and we're like, oh, that's a neat story. Right? Like we think everything in the Bible is parable for some reason. Like, oh, it's there to teach us a lesson about something. This is rooted in history. It's a real event. Real events took place. Haman really did aspire to kill the Jews. Mordecai really did uh, save the king's life. And then Mordecai really did save the Jews uh, with the power of King Ahasuerus standing beside him. Mordecai really was elevated in position. All of this is historically accurate. Check the records. That's what he's saying. By the way, those records um, will eventually, I assume, be dug out of the dirt at some point because the Persians kept their stuff in little jar, clay jars. And we're finding those year over year over year. One of the things I love about biblical archaeology is when, when, when someone says, that never could have happened, that didn't happen like that, give it 10 or 15 years, some guy digging in the dirt somewhere pulls it out of the ground. Oh, just like the Bible said. Isn't that amazing? Just, just like the Bible said, God is confirming uh, through, through uh, pagans what he has accomplished. The, 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 the bulk, though, of chapter 9 that I finished reading there talks about the Jewish response to what Mordecai proclaimed. Mordecai said, we're going to have a day to celebrate what God has done. And the Jewish people across Persia obligated themselves to keeping it. That's a weird term, right? To obligate yourself to do something. But when they heard Mordecai's plan to have this festival of Purim on these two days, <coughs> excuse me, they said... That is something that we will do, and that is something that our children and their children will do. And anyone who comes into our group from outside and becomes one of us will keep that too. Because that day is a day we will remember. We're going to remember what happened on that day. It's a day of celebration, but it's a day of remembrance as well. One of the things that I think we struggle with as, as Christians today is our memories are not that good. We don't remember what God has done because we get stuck in what is going on now. Like right now, this moment, something isn't right. By the way, that's, that's pretty easy to see in the world right now, right? We're in the middle of a once in a generation, once in a, a, a century pandemic, something crazy going on in the world, and our memory can't focus on all that God has done along the way. That's why I want to encourage you, I want to beg you, take some time to remember what God has done. As we get into the Christmas season, as we, as we look back on what God did um, at, at the first advent where, where Christ entered into the world through the incarnation. As we look at that big event that takes place, take time to remember what God has done in your life. I find that my pencil and my paper is a better memory than my mind. So I can look back at things that I've written from years gone by and I can be like, oh, God was there. God was there. Like, I asked for this. I'll journal my prayers and say, I asked God for this. And I didn't even recognize when it was fulfilled six months later. I didn't even notice it. But then when I look back, I'm like, oh, there you were. Oh, you, you, you did that too. Oh, God, you, you filled that, that need in my life. Oh, God, you answered this prayer and this prayer and this prayer and this prayer. You responded to what I asked. And even though I may not have seen it in the moment when I look back with clear eyes, I can remember the providence of God in my life. We, guys, we need to remember that God has providentially been taking care of you all the days of your life. He's still in the business of doing that. And sometimes we get stuck in the moment and we can't get perspective, right? We can't pull the lens back far enough to see that God has been guiding your steps every path you've been on. Everywhere you go, God has been alongside of you. And while the path may look dark, and while it may be shadowy, and maybe it's something you would never wish on your worst enemy. Some of you have walked past that you would not wish on people that you despise. Because the path is too dark. But even in those paths, God has been carrying you along the way. You know, my darkest seasons in my life, and there have been several... I can look back now in a time of relative peace in my life and see that God was using those events for his purposes in my life. Whether it was to, do, to, to um, strengthen my character, 
right, to bring something out of me that was lacking, that wasn't fully formed, or whether it was just to teach me that I can trust God through the midst of sorrow and hurt. Right? And if you're hurting today, if you're struggling today, if this Christmas season is the opposite of a season of joy, right, it's a season of lament, it's a season of sorrow, I just want you to know God is near to you today. It's what we're going to celebrate as we turn our eyes towards uh, the arrival of Jesus Christ, that God draws near. He didn't stay aloof in heaven, right, in a different plane of existence. When humanity was suffering and the world was at its worst, he jumped in and became one of us to walk alongside of us. And he still is jumping in and walking alongside of us. And so the Jews in the days of Mordecai were called to remember, and they obligated themselves, said, we are going to remember this. We're going to set a day aside, and we're going to remember this day. Some people have an issue with uh, the Christian holidays. Christmas, Easter, I don't know, there's probably other ones they have a problem with. Because there's a lot of weird co-opting inside of Christianity uh, with pagan religions. Like this tree right here, it right, looks nice. It looks nice. It's a beautiful tree, right? But like you can, you go and you can look and be like, well, there was this festival somewhere, and really the Christians just kind of stole the tree and co-opted it in, you know, at some pagan ritual somewhere over in Europe. Like maybe, right? Maybe so. Oh, when I set a tree up in my house, I'm not celebrating paganism, just so you know, inside of myself, right? But there's something about saying there's a day that we're going to set aside. To remember. And you may not like the day that was chosen. You may not like that it was chosen December 25th that falls near the winter solstice and there's some wicked stuff going on there. You may not like that. You may not like that Easter was selected and it's close to this specific other Babylonian holiday, Ishtar and all, whatever. You may not like the day that was selected. I'm not, I'm not even here to debate that with you. I find that to be a fruitless debate, by the way. But there's something about saying, there's a day that I'm going to remember. I'm going to put my mind on that on this day. Instead of focusing on all the problems in the world around me, instead of focusing on myself today, I'm going to focus on the arrival of Jesus Christ. Or I'm going to focus myself on the resurrection of Jesus. That's what Easter is, right? We focus on the resurrection of victory in Jesus. What I love about the, the, the Easter celebration, though, is it's not the annual celebration. It is a weekly disciplined celebration. Like we are called to remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ Sunday. Is that a word? Should be. Every Sunday. We're called to remember that. Typically, we're called to gather together to do that. There are exceptions to that. Maybe you're unable to be there, or maybe there's other things going on. But typically, we're called to gather together to celebrate, like we're supposed to be doing, that moment. Because our mind on this day, this Sunday, should be fixed on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a rhythm in our lives. It should be part of our life. That, that while Monday we may be focused on how to please the boss, and on Saturday we may be focused on whether or not our college football team is going to win, uh, right, right. Maybe you've got your focus on the things of the thing, but when Sunday comes, our mind goes back and we remember and we celebrate the thing that matters the most. It's part of the routine of our lives. I'm not here to shame you for your church attendance. Most of y'all have pretty good church attendance. Good job, guys. Um, I, I don't even, like, I don't care particularly about your church attendance. I do care about your ability to remember Easter on a regular basis, though. And the Jews obligated themselves, says, we are going to do this on these days. And the Christian church followed that lead uh, when they established their day of worship on Sunday. They said, we are going to remember on this day what God has done. Right? That, that honor the Sabbath and keep it holy, the third commandment, uh, out of the ten commandments, the idea of the Sabbath. Right? Well, well it's difficult for us to push that into Christianity in some ways. This remembrance season, celebrate and remember, is right there. And so my call to you today, Christian, is this. First of all, it's to celebrate and remember what God has done 
in your life. Remember and celebrate the providence of God and then choose inside of yourself, like the Jews had the choice, to obligate yourselves to making that part of your rhythm. Part of your weekly rhythm. Right? And a lot of us, we're, we're fairly structured people. We know on this day we do this, and on this day we do this, and on this day we do this. Make Sunday one of those days where you say, I'm going to remember and celebrate. Maybe you're not here every Sunday. That's okay. I, honestly, guys, that's okay. It does not bother me that you're, you're, you're out. But when you're away, remember what God has done. Celebrate what God has done. Because God is a God worthy of celebrating and remembering. Because he's worked in your life providentially in amazing ways. The book of Esther shows us the providence of God over and over again. God does, through secret methods, work out his big purposes in this world. He just works towards what he wants to get done. It's a, it's a beautiful story of how God does that. He's not even mentioned, as we've said many times. He's not even mentioned in the book once. But he is pulling the story to the point that it needs to get to. And he's done that in all of human history. Climax at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Easter event. So we remember and we celebrate. If you're a believer today, I want you to put that as part of your rhythm in your week. You may say, I, I watch the news at this time, or I do this at this time, and I do this at this time. Right? A lot of us, our, our rhythms got all out of whack in March. Right? We, we haven't found a rhythm since then. Right? I get out of bed and I, I don't get dressed anymore. What happened? Um, but make this a part of your rhythm. The celebration here is a part of that, but really it's bigger than church. It's bigger than church tenants. It's bigger than all of that. It's really about making that part of your, your, your life. Do you eat, sleep, and breathe the resurrection? This is Christian, you should. It's not a better event to celebrate than that. Let me pray.